So, good evening. The door is closed. That means I can start. Welcome in the session. The 689 upgrade MCSA on Windows 7 to Windows 8, and of course, in meantime, 8.1. Um, I normally start with a question, who has never done an exam prep before? Okay, that's good. Because the first, like, first 10 minutes is not really on a technical level. It's more about why is it important for you to actually be certified. But since you're all here for an upgrade part, I assume you're all certified on Windows 7. Who is not? Okay, you can stay. I mean, all the content that I'm going to talk about is, of course, mainly targeted towards the ones who are coming from a Windows 7 certification, MCSA, to, uh, well, it's not MCSA, it's MCITP at that time, um, moving up to the uh, Windows 8. But most of the content is still valid. The only thing is you have to take two separate exams. But I got a few slides on that one as well. But everything else, I mean, the content I'm going to talk about, the things you need for the exam are almost the same. The only thing is that the 689 is like the two other ones in a condensed version. But of course, you need to still need to know the technology. So you can stay. Good. So a couple of things about myself. Um, the main reason why I'm presenting here is I'm an MCT, so Microsoft Certified Trainer. Um, so quite a lot of them here uh, at TechEd this week. So we have the, the study hall on uh, the third floor. Um, we have a, a booth downstairs in the expo. So if you have any questions on the certification part, like um, about development, about Windows uh, Server 2012, things like that, we are actually all staffing as MCTs. So we can help you with that. Besides that, of course, as an MCT, we are not only talking about certification, but we're also talking about the technology. So when I started my career in somewhere in 96, um, I was working more like a, a database admin on SAP uh, on a mainframe at that time. And then I could follow the first migration from SAP on mainframe to SAP on a Windows platform and T4 server. And I love the infrastructure part, and I stick to the infrastructure part for the rest of my career. So I'm doing a mix between uh, consulting and training, and it depends a bit on the market. So I'm working as a freelance. Sometimes there are periods where I only do like three months full-time training week after week. And sometimes it's a mix between two days of coaching, doing a project, some training in the beginning of the project, some training at the end. Um, I'm also an MVP on Windows, a Windows expert, uh, which is mainly client-oriented. So now you know who the fellow is here in front of you. Key thing, session objectives, first of all, is not giving you free exam questions. You might think like, yeah, that would be easy. Um, but still quite a lot of people think like, yeah, the exam prep is just an overview of 50 possible questions we can get at the exam. But that's not the idea of the session. The main idea of the session is giving you an overview of all the topics you need to know to actually pass the exam. The main thing is when you walk out a session in about an hour and you have the feeling like everything the guy was talking about, I know it like this, then walk out, make a reservation, and take the exam. During the remainder of TechEd, it's 50% off, so it's 75 US dollar that you have to pay. We also have free test, uh, test exams where you can try. It's not always a guarantee to pass, but if you are quite good in doing the test exams, you normally should pass the real exam as well. So the key thing is walking you through all the content that you need to know. Maybe there are things in Windows 8, Windows 8.1, that you use in your day-to-day -day business, helping customers as a help desk uh, officer or maybe an architect, whatever job role you're in. Um, but maybe that specific topic is not relevant for the exam. So the, the key thing of this session is giving you information. What are the topics of all the cool stuff in Windows 8, Windows 8.1? What is the thing that I need to know to make sure that I get through my exam? You'll notice I'm going to talk about Windows 8, 8.1 a lot. Just remember it's a mix between 8 and 8.1. Normally, the exam is already quite updated to 8.1, but there still might be some scenarios where it's explicitly mentioned, like you're working in a Windows 8 environment. 
maybe on that specific topic, something has changed in 8.1, and it's not valid for that question. So when I'm talking about 8 or 8.1, just think that it's the Windows 8 operating system with the 8.1 update installed. Good. Any other questions before I continue? You're all good with the objective? Cool. The audience, again, not that important. Well, it's important, but the key thing is, first of all, it's an upgrade exam, which means you normally, <coughs> sorry, you normally have to have the certification for Windows 7 already. But if not, I already mentioned it, all the content will be almost the same. Just keep in mind that this content is like condensed format, and if you don't have the uh, Windows 7 credential yet, you have to take two exits. But of course, it's the same technology, so there's no real change. So a couple of words about the certification. First of all, why do you take an exam? Why do you take an exam? It's mainly for you. And okay, you might think, yeah, that's, that's just easy talk. I mean, my boss is forcing me to take my exam. He is paying for the exam, so if I fail, he's even more angry than he already might be, I don't know. Um, but the key thing is, even if your company is asking for it, if you're working for a Microsoft partner, they might use your credentials for staying a Microsoft certified partner. Um, if you're working in any other organization where um, the value of the certification is important out of the company, they come to your office like, hey, can you take the exam, please? Because, yeah, we think you're our Windows 8 guy to be. Uh, and then you think like, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll take the course, I'll take the exam, um, just because my boss ordered me to do. But that's not the main idea. The key thing is becoming certified, being certified, first of all, is for yourself. It helps you in your career. It shows you like the expert of the technology. So it's, first of all, it's for you. If you don't agree, let me know. I think I'm quite sure about what I'm talking about. I took the same path. I mean, when I started working uh, in, in that company at that time, certification was like, yeah, whatever. You don't need to be. But then you move up in, in your career. And then I did in implementations, NT4 server, Windows 2000, uh, Windows XP clients at that time. And at some point in time, you want to show that you actually know the technology. And the only thing you can really show you know the technology is I'm certified. I have my credentials. And I know, and probably quite a lot of you in the past had maybe colleagues, maybe knew someone like, yeah, the guy did the exam, he passed, but he didn't really know the technology. That has changed a lot. Got a few slides on that one as well. The key thing is about the certification. For you, it's important. But of course, for Microsoft, it's, it's also very important. What's the thing about having a certification program if it's worth nothing? If you go out like, hey, you know, I'm the MCSA, I'm an MCSE on server platform messaging, whatever technology you want to get certified on, and some hiring manager says like, yeah, I know, but the Microsoft certification doesn't mean anything. Anybody can do it. If you're like 12 years old or you're like 60 years old, knowing the te technology or not knowing the technology, anybody could pass the exam then you are losing the value of the certification. So Microsoft, two years ago, did a lot of changes in the MCP program, so the Microsoft Certified Professional Program, and they made the exams harder. Now, that's an easy explanation. Why is it considered harder? Because it's more relevant to the practical experience, the hands-on experience with the technology. So my key message in this session, and I'll probably repeat it quite a lot, is you need to have hands-on experience with the technology. And that's for quite a lot of people a change compared to a few years ago. Where you could just read a book, search some stuff on the internet, and take the exam, and cool, I passed the exam. It doesn't work like that anymore. I mean, we've been talking with a few, uh, well, quite a lot of people here who are actually taking the exam, like, yeah, you know, it's 50% off. Uh, I just try it out, if I fail, I'm actually not really losing my money. I can do a retake the day after. And then they walk in, like, yeah, I'm going to do it. And we'll see. And then they come back, like, yeah, I failed. But actually, it's good I failed, because I don't know the technology. So it's like, Microsoft, you actually did a good thing there. 
So that's quite important. Next thing, certification is important for your career. I started as a database admin. Maybe they did a mistake there, I don't know. Um, but I fell in love with the infrastructure part. And by taking exams, by being certified, for me personally, it was a lot easier to move up in my career. I moved from DBA, of course, but then Helpdesk, uh, a technical guy installing the PCs, installing servers in the ice cold server rooms. Um, now all the way up to being freelance, being an infrastructure architect, mainly because I'm certified in the technologies. And people are actually understanding, like, if you got a, this list of certifications, if you are doing these trainings as a trainer, if you are doing these uh, consulting projects, you got the hands-on experience. And that's what I mean, Bon, it's important for your career. You can move up in the chain, if you want to call it like that. So that's quite important. Now, a couple of things about the changes in the Microsoft uh, certification program, where you can consider the exams being harder. First of all, they are more relevant to the nowadays technologies, to the nowadays environments. One of the topics, and I'm going to talk about the technical ones in, in the next few minutes, but one of the things is quite a lot about mobile device management, interaction with cloud. Why? Because the operating system, your Windows 8 machine you install in the office, it's not that isolated machine anymore. There are certain, um, yeah, like cloud components, the Windows Store, for example, uh, the OneDrive, it's, it's built in in the operating system. And you as an, uh, a Windows 8 admin, Windows 8 uh, system installer, you actually have to know all these components. So you might think, yeah, but even in my environment, you are actually blocking users from, from using OneDrive. Yeah, okay, but in the end, it's, it's still very relevant for the nowadays technologies. Next to that, a broader skill set. Quite a lot of questions we get from people who were certified in the past is like, yeah, you know, um, I once had my certification on, on, for example, configuration manager, one exam for SCCM. I want to do my upgrade from the 2007 version to 2012, and there is no specific SCCM exam anymore. Now, that's correct. Now, what's the problem? I wouldn't say it's a problem. What's the thing there? All technologies, Microsoft technologies, are coming together. If you install Windows 8, you have to know Active Directory a bit. You have to know DNS a bit. You need to know some stuff about VPN settings, firewall settings, those kind of things. Yeah, you can think like, yeah, you know, in our office, we just shut down the Windows firewall. Yeah, okay, then that's valid in your environment. If, however, you're not turning off the Windows firewall and you don't know anything about firewalling and security in general, it's probably a very hard component for you to configure. So that's what we mean by the broader skill set. It's not only the isolated operating system anymore. It's a lot, a lot more. Rigor, it's the exams are harder to take. It's still anything, depending on the technology, anything between uh, two hours and, and I think the hardest one, the four hours, for server-specific exams. Um, so yes, they are harder. But again, if you have the hands-on experience with the technology, it shouldn't be harder than before. So it's all about how well do I already know the product. So again, if there are certain topics I'm going to talk about later on that you'd link like, yeah, um, I don't know anything about what the guy is talking about, then you know you're not ready to take the exam. Maybe there are seven topics I'm going to talk about, and if there's only one of them, yeah, you can just focus on studying a bit more on that specific topic, and you know we will probably pass the exam. A lot of questions we also get is about what is the certification requirement? What are the different steps that I need to take? So for example, for this one, you have to be Windows 7 certified already. If you're not, we of course have another option. Once you are MCSA on the Windows client, you can move up to become MCSA or even MCSD if you want. So it's a bit deciding, am I an IT pro? Am I more on the infrastructure side or am I actually more into the developer space? Even developers, I always recommend them to take the infrastructure exam for Windows 8. 
there are certain components that are still valid for them as developers as well. Increased rigor, I men already mentioned. A um, couple of words about that one. How did they, Microsoft, how do they make the exams harder? First of all, they changed the way they are asking the questions. By taking the exams, you will see that the, question, the way the questions are formed is totally different than it used to be in, like, let's say, the XP or Vista timeframe. By, for example, working with Sorry, <laughs> by working with uh, scenario-based questions. You are the system admin of this particular environment, and we want you to achieve this as a goal. And then they give you a couple of scenario questions out of that specific scenario. Or they show you, for example, a screenshot of the, I don't know, let's say the certificate snapping. You want to import a uh, auto-enrollment certificate to connect to a Wi-Fi environment, for example. Uh, they show you a screenshot of the certificate snap -in, and then they highlight a few areas, and you have to pinpoint the correct area. Now, again, if you're reading about the topic about certificates, you might think, yeah, you know, it's just going into a console and selecting the certificate, but that's not enough anymore. You actually need to go play with the technology, install it in a lab environment, play with the technology, and do all the different things you can do with the technology. So the hands-on experience is very, very important. There are a lot of, um, couple of other possible scenarios, like um, I'm thinking about one specific for this exam. Uh, is, for example, again, another screenshot or a series of screenshots um, or even buttons where you have to put them in the right order. So, for example, if one of the questions is, um, what are the different steps you need to take to install a printer? Just a, an example. You have to install the printer, go out to the internet, find the driver, and maybe install the, uh, or configure the IP settings for the printer and so on. Make the connection with Active Directory published printer. So all the different steps, they just give you a list of, I don't know, six, seven buttons, and you have to dra drag and drop them in the correct order. That's how they change the type of questions. And again, it's not about making it harder for you. It's about how well does he or she know the technology. That's the key thing. A couple of things around the exam by itself without, again, diving into the technology yet, is how many questions do I get? It depends. It depends on the region. It depends on your language. It might even depend on the period when you're taking the exam. But overall, it's anything between 40 and 60 questions. Might be that, let's say, you and your colleague are taking the exam at the same time, that you got like 45 questions, and your colleague has 60 questions. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, um, you got anything between one hour and four hours for the exam. Again, it depends a bit on the specific exam. Again, uh, it depends a bit on your language. So for example, if English is not your native language, like in my case, I'm from Belgium, um, I can extend my period with, I think, 30 minutes. Because Microsoft gives you some additional timing if English is not your default language. I don't know all the different languages you can decide, but I think if you're French speaking, uh, Chinese, German, I think, they can do the full exam in their own language as well. Some things about the scoring itself. Scoring is 700. It's a metric. You need to have 700. But 700 doesn't mean 70%. So the 70% is like the reflection you have when you're still at, at school or attending an uh, academic institution. Like 700 is 70%, but that's not the same. It's just a number you need to have. When you get the report, uh, once, you take, once you pass the exam, or you've done the exam, you get a report. And all the different sections of the uh, topics are actually listed. So imagine you got like five different topics. You fail on one of them, and therefore you fail on the full exam. You know that, OK, I'm only bad on 
that specific topic. And then by doing the retake, yeah, you know you don't have to study everything again, and then only focus on that specific section. So the scoring is a cut score. Each question is one point. It doesn't work like, for example, if there's a multiple choice question uh, in the style like, give me the uh, all possible uh, settings that are valid. They give you a list of seven possible options and you have to select like three or four of them. Now let's say you select three correct ones and you miss one, then you miss the whole question. So it's not like you get like three fourth of the, uh, of the points. So it's always correct or wrong. So that's rather easy. Now how to interpret the questions? It's always starting with a business problem, like you are working for organization this and this. We have multiple environments worldwide and you need to allow configure branch cache, for example. That's your business problem. Goal statement is you want to achieve optimization in networking connections, followed by one or more multiple answers. And then depending on the format, it's multi-selection, it's um, drag and drop, so that depends on the question by itself. And then of course, somewhere in between the, the scenario description, multiple distractors. So it might be that you got like a half a page um, description of the three different topics, and maybe the answer is like super easy. Probably not, but you know what I mean. Now very important questions and the way they are formed are not intended to trick you. Now if you think when you're going through the exam, if you think, yeah, like, I don't really get this question or out of my experience, I think the way the question is asked or the way the scenario is described is wrong, at the end of your exam, you have the possibility to give feedback to Microsoft. And the feedback is actually read by a team of people that aren't doing anything else than just reading your feedback. Because feedback on the questions is very important for Microsoft. So if there's anything you don't agree with, just let them know. Last few words about the certification itself um, is the upgrade part. So if you have the Windows 7 credential, one of the MCITP um, exams, you did them in the Windows 7 timeframe, there's only one exam you have to take to become MCSA on Windows 8. That's a 689, but you knew that because that's the topic of the session. If, however, my, it's not really responding anymore. Um, if, however, you're not certified on Windows 7, or maybe you weren't certified on the client at all, or maybe on XP, or I had a guy this afternoon when I was down at the expo hall. He said, you know, uh, I got my MCSE on Windows 2000. Can I still do an upgrade? I was like, mm, not really. <laughs> uh, so he was a bit disappointed. He was like, oh man, it took me so, so many months to actually go through all the exams. I think it were like seven or eight at that time. And he was like, yeah, do I have to go through all that again? I was like, yeah, sorry. But it's, I mean, it's normal. Compare the Windows 2000 client with Windows 8. It's not exactly the same anymore. So that's quite important. So if you don't, uh, can take the, the upgrade part. It's two exams, 687, 688. But in general, the content is about the same. It's only split up in, in two different exams. Besides this session, very valuable information you can find during TechEd is first of all hands-on labs. Now why hands-on labs? Because again, you need the hands-on experience. Anyone already been to the hands-on labs corner? Good. For this exam? No. Uh, not that, well, not that lab. Uh, I went to one of the operating systems in point five, which was Windows 8. Mm -hmm. yeah. Happy about labs? Yeah. Useful. So far, so good. Uh, it's given me a couple of uh, insights on how to correct our operating system uh, creation processes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No? Good feedback. Thanks. Another very interesting thing is the study hall. So it's on the third floor um, where we have, uh, I don't know by heart, I think close to 200 machines available. Oh, probably a bit less, but well, doesn't matter. 
quite a lot of PCs available where you can actually take free test exams. So we, Microsoft, um, is providing test exams by Transcender. You can buy a subscription if you're not doing the tests during TechEd. But here during TechEd, they make the PCs available and you can actually try the exam. So it's not an exact copy of the live exam, it's a test. But again, if you take the test exam, it will help you a lot by, okay, I'm quite strong in that specific topic and these are maybe the topics I failed on. Helping you in, of course, taking the exam, passing. That's the key thing. Another thing is the live sessions. I mean, besides all the, the other cool stuff and the parties and the drinks, and I know I'm in between technology and the drinks, um, but the live sessions are actually the main source for helping you as well. So imagine you're uh, not familiar with, I don't know, uh, Windows 8 deployment. Let's take an easy one, the starter. You're very good in managing the operating system, but you've never done any deployment by using Windows deployment services, by using MDT whatsoever. There are quite a lot of sessions about that topic. So maybe just by attending that session, you learn already more information than you will ever learn by just going to the chapters, by reading a book or so on. So that's also very interesting. And of course, a bit more commercial, 50% off. So instead of paying the 150 US dollars, and the 150 US dollars might change a bit in, in your uh, specific country. So for in my case, I pay 150 euro, which is close to a 200 US dollars. Um, so 75 US dollar this week. So it might help you as well. A bit more back to the technical assistance, have your tools available. I assume you all have somewhere a Windows 8 copy available in your office, maybe at home. If not, you can still download a trial version. It runs for 180 days, which should normally be enough for learning the stuff, doing your technology, and passing the exam. Outside of TechNet, uh, TechEd, sorry, is also very useful, the virtual apps. Anyone already played with the virtual apps? Mm -hmm. Good. So it's like um, an online environment, TechNet virtual apps, where they have a full set of uh, technology, VMs, hosted VMs available, and not only the VMs are running, but you got a detailed lab guide. Even quite a lot of the labs you see here at the hands-on labs are actually almost a copy-paste from the TechNet virtual labs. They are run by the same team and background in their data center, so very, very useful as well. So imagine you have to play with branch cache, allowing file synchronization between multiple sites. You don't have a multiple site structure in your specific organization, and you think like, yeah, man, how can I ever get my hands-on skills for the branch cache topic if I don't have the infrastructure available? Go out to the TechNet virtual labs. There are a few labs specifically targeted towards branch cache, for example, just to name one example. So with that, my question, are you ready for taking the flight to 689? Who says yes? Who says yes? yes. Good. So this is all about what do I need to know for taking the exam? And again, it won't be the real deep dive technical stuff, but again, highlighting the main objectives when you are taking the exam. What is the stuff that I need to know? And again, maybe there are certain topics that you're familiar with that are very important for your organization, for your doing your day-to-day -day business that aren't relevant for the exam. And that's the key thing of this, uh, the remainder of this session. Quickly going through them, first of all, quite logic, you will learn how to install and upgrade to Windows 8, how to implement the operating system. Next thing is configuring hardware and applications, moving over to remote access and mobility, backup recovery, resource access, Windows client and device maintenance, like Windows Update, for example, is a key topic there, and the interaction with cloud and MDOP optimization pack. All familiar topics? Anything you think like? 
didn't even know that it existed. Oh, that's good. So install and upgrade Windows 8. The key objective is how to install my operating system by, for example, talking about or getting questions around Windows to go. I assume you're all using Windows to go. Cool feature. Starting Windows 8 by using a USB drive or USB stick if you want. Mm -hmm. So that's quite important. Also very, very important, again, it's an upgrade exam, is how to migrate my platform from previous versions. So very important there is not only what are the migration tools, but also very important to know what can be migrated from what operating system. I don't have to tell you that a migration from XP to 8 is probably a bit harder than from 7 to 8. Just know that it's possible and certain things can be taken with it during the migration, some others not. So that's quite important to know. And of course, also the baseline install, how to install the operating system by using uh, an ISO file, by using Windows deployment services, by using MDT maybe. Doesn't mean that you have to be like the MDT specialist, but just know that MDT is one of the possible solutions for doing the deployment. And of course, SCCM, but can't remember getting any questions about SCCM on my exam. Um, maybe just one of the possible tools that allow you to actually deploy Windows. Might have been one of them, I don't know. Then using the migration and configure your user data. What can be migrated if a user has his machine? In the morning, it's still running Windows 7. During noon, we do an upgrade, and what will be the outcome? What will be copied in the profile? What are the things that are lost? Do I need to reinstall um, some applications and so on? That's like the typical question, right? What are the different tools? What are the different steps you need to take to achieve this and this? So always think about in, in that kind of scenario. They give you like, you're the admin, uh, you're running an environment with a thousand PCs, a mix between XP and Vista, and <coughs> you want to move over to Windows 8, and you have, I don't know, uh, WDS, the Windows Deployment Services, available. What are the different steps that I need to take to deploy Windows 8 in my specific environment? Which means you have to install or create a new template, maybe download the ISO file, and some other stuff you have to do. So that's quite, quite important. Hardware requirements. This is always a fun discussion. When I'm doing training in a classroom around Windows 8, talking or referring to the exam, it's always like, man, but this isn't really valid. Quite important. These are the official Microsoft numbers. These are the numbers you need to take with you for the exam. And maybe you might think like, yeah, 32-bit, 2 gigs of RAM, it's not really user-friendly, giving them a new operating system running on some five, seven-year-old PC. But again, the operating system is ready for running on a 2 gig machine. Maybe you're not happy with it. Maybe your end user is not happy with it. But for the exam, it's valid if it's a machine with 2 gigs. So again, here a possible scenario could be they give you a list of I don't know, let's say five different machine types, running XP, running Windows 7, maybe running some non-Microsoft operating system, and then you have to pinpoint which machines can actually be migrated, be upgraded, can be reused for Windows 8. Again, trying to help you with how to think, how can they make a simple table into an exam question. Upgrade path, very important. I'm gonna show you the slide for a few seconds. What can be upgraded and what cannot be upgraded? Preview versions cannot, period. If you see a question, if you see a scenario, we are running uh, a beta deployment program of Windows 8, a preview version we downloaded from the website. Users are happy with it and now we wanna migrate or put the machines in, in, in production, what's the migration part? It's easy, there is none. I still remember one of the questions, but it was on the Windows 7 exam at that time, where the answer was none. 
And I was like, is this actually correct? You get like three or four different possible answers. And then the fourth one was, it's not possible. And I was thinking like, why would they ever answer, ask a question where the answer is, it's actually not possible? But that's very important, because again, it means you have the technology. You have the knowledge about the product. Windows 7 can be upgraded, can be migrated, Windows Vista and Windows XP. But again, quite important, by using the different operating system flavors, the stuff you can migrate becomes less and less. So just remember what is possible in the migration path and what is not. Next topic, hardware and applications. Hardware and applications, quite easy. First of all, you need to know how to install and control the installation of the Windows Store applications. Knowing that, for example, in the base version of Windows 8, the original RTM Windows 8, on a Windows to go stick, the Windows Store access was disabled by default. There was some registry key work around to make it available. By moving to 8.1, Windows to go store access is enabled by default. So that's just one of the tips and tricks I can give you. Next to that is configuring Hyper-V. Oh no, Hyper-V. But Hyper-V, that's like a, a server technology, right? You're using it for running virtual server platforms. Hyper-V is a key component of the Windows 8 client operating system as well. Not all features you might know from Hyper-V server side are valid, are working in, in Windows 8, but you have to know how to install, for example, <coughs> sorry, the Hyper-V server com uh, client component. It's not like you have the experience from the server side where you go to the server manager, installing add server roles and features, there is no server role and features on the client. So that's again having the hands-on experience. A couple of things about Hyper-V, it's not only installing the Hyper-V component, but how to play with switches, how to configure them, how to configure the different network options, like private, internal, external. These are still valid. And again, that's like a super question they can ask you. You have your production development machine available, and you want to try out some software by using Hyper-V on your client. What kind of network setting will you apply? Based on the specific scenario, might be that I don't know, question eight on the exam, the correct answer is external, where maybe seven questions later, you get like almost the same scenario but like a small difference saying, uh, you wanna make sure that you cannot reach the internet from your virtual machine in any way, yeah, then you know you have to change the network type. Another key tip and trick I can give you is take your time for reading the question. I did a lot of exams, I failed a lot of exams. Is that bad? Yeah, that's bad. Not only because I have to tell my boss, well, not anymore because I'm running my own company, but still. Um, not only because I have to tell my wife and kids, like, yeah, you know, I spent my whole weekend studying, and then I failed, and they'll go like, oh, man, that's not, that's not good. You were taking our family time away, and then you still fail the exam? Yeah. The key thing is, if you fail the exam, and you know why you failed, that's more important. I know I failed a lot of exams because I didn't give myself enough time to actually read the questions. Or like, yeah, you start reading the question and you think about, oh, okay, that's the correct answer. And then the rest of the question, you already forgot about it. Or you just didn't pay attention. And then you picked, of course, the wrong answer. So take your time in a normal situation you have more than enough time to actually go through each and every question. Think about the, let's say, 50 questions, two hours and a half, should be more than enough. Not all questions are like 30 lines long. Some of them are just two lines and should be easy. The Windows Store, again, a couple of words. How to download the Metro style apps from the store. 
You have to use a Microsoft account. You can install it on a maximum of five PCs. So for example, again, another example. Here you're running an SMB environment, having 50 machines. Um, you configure a Windows client account on three machines in the office, a tablet, um, a laptop, and can that user use the same live account at home for installing the same Windows app on his PC? No, because then he's running more than five installs and it's not possible. How to disable the Windows Store or by using a policy or if you want by using a registry key but normally in a corporate business environment. I assume you all have Active Directory, domain joint clients, so group policies might be the best thing. Site loading, how to install the Windows 8 app on my machine. Site loading, very important. Why? Because it's like the key feature of Windows, besides the operating system, of course, but what's the operating system without an application? So side loading, knowing the ins and outs, how to prepare my machine for side loading, how to get my applications installed in a decent way. And again, thinking about different steps, maybe thinking about some screenshots they show you where you have to select the correct area where you have to make certain settings. Quite important. Client Hyper-V, uh, let me check, I think it can be quite Gutierrez. Yeah, very important, 64-bit machine, four gigs of RAM. What do you mean four gigs of RAM? A few slides ago, you mentioned a table where Windows 8 can run on a two gig machine. That's right. Imagine the scenario, question one, this is a list of PCs where I can install Windows 8. If you see somewhere a machine with two gigs of RAM, it's enough. If, however, question five on the exam is, this is the same list of machines, but we not only want to run Windows 8, but on top of that, we want to run Windows 8 with Hyper-V, the answer will be different. Second important aspect of client Hyper-V on Windows 8 is the second layer address translation. It's a component in your physical machine. If that component is not there, you cannot run Hyper-V on top of the machine. Also very important. If you want to know the ins and outs of Hyper-V on a client, there's a reference. Slides will be made available. Um, I did a session two days ago. Two days ago? Yeah, on Monday. With all the parties, I mean, it's sometimes becoming a bit difficult. Uh, and even, well, no, not the parties, the time zone difference. Let's say it like that. Um, so there's a, a specific link, but the slide deck will be made available. I did a session on Monday on the uh, server 2012, and it's already available on channel nine for download. So I assume this one will probably be live maybe on, on Friday, maybe tomorrow, I, I don't know. But just know that it's, that it's there, so you don't have to write everything down, don't have to take pictures of each and every slide I, I'm showing you. So everything will be made available anyway. So the first practical question for you, just an example. Don't write the question down. It won't appear on your exam. It's just a sample question. But just to get you a bit familiar with the way they ask the questions. All read the question? Yeah. So what do you think about the answers? A and C? B and C? B and C. Who was right? Who was wrong? You know why? Sorry? Sorry. <laughs> is this helpful? Like, another thing is, and 
again on, on the slide it's a bit emphasized but what are the two minimum hardware requirements and choose two on your life exam the last two won't be in capitals but just here to pinpoint you make sure that you read the question they give you four options give me two answers maybe they give you a similar question like seven questions later looks similar but they only ask you one or maybe three answers so if you pin like oh yeah okay I know um, it's the uh, option C and then at the end you fail you know why because you need to pick two of them next topic remote access and mobility configure the remote options so going to uh, offline policies, power policies, windows to go, there it is again, Wi-Fi direct, playing with uh, GPS settings, for example, configuring BitLocker, also quite important. BitLocker, BitLocker to go. Why should I use it? How can I use it? How do I need to configure it? That's all part of the game. Windows to go how to install it on a USB drive. Does it work on any USB drive? No, you need to have a specific Windows to go certified USB drive. Again, <coughs> sorry, again, if you haven't played with the technology, you're like, where well, Windows to go? It, it's a Windows operating system on a USB stick. No, it's not just on any USB stick. There are only like eight supported versions. And it's out on the Windows 8 product website, so by studying, using different uh, materials to prepare yourself, you know that it's not running on any uh, USB device. Hibernation, disk is offline, TPM is not used. So if you see a question like, I wanna use TPM, virtual smart cards, integration with Windows to go, it doesn't work. Backup and recovery, yeah, I'm just speeding up a bit to make sure that you get uh, all the time to go to the happy hour after this session. Um, and yeah, showing you another few sample questions as well. Backup and recovery, very important. First of all, how to take a backup. By using, for example, the system recovery disk. By using backup files. What do I need to backup if I want to make sure that I have a full backup of my operating system? Or maybe I just need to copy the user profile settings and I don't care about anything else. Or I'm using the USMT, the user state migration tool, to migrate a profile, a user profile from Windows 7 to Windows 8. I reinstall the machine, I need to do a restore of the profile. So that's all classified under backup and recovery. Next thing is the system recovery options. Very, very important that you know all the different options and you know how they work. This is like when your machine comes up out of Hibernate and for whatever reason, it's not loading the full operating system. You got like the blue screen on Windows 8. Anyone seen the blue screen already? It's a good one, right? Mm -hmm. We got uh, the Windows error out, and we just had blue screen that really was the big with this with this tab base most of them. I don't know. No, we, we figured it out. That, that was like, uh, I thought that was interesting because mm. that's how the new blue screen is. Uh, uh, the file recovery options. So what about restoring not only the full operating system but only certain parts of it? Um, creating file restore points, so if you're installing an application, if you're installing Windows updates, that you know how to create a system recovery point, those kind of things. File history, so again, for example, they show you a screenshot, and I don't know, they ask you what can I invent about this one. For example, which is the correct option to delete browsing history? And then you go through it and you're a bit in a rush and then you pick the delete share history. 
because you weren't a question, reading it right. So that's how they make it a bit harder. If you've played with it, if you know the technology, if you got a hands-on experience, you know that the file history is on that side and the browser history is on the other side. So another example question. Got it? Who says A? B? C? Most of you? D? No one? You know why? Got a question on it like? Most of you said C. So you all know why it's not C? I'm wondering now why in the control system configuration mm -hmm. there's an actual there's an actual module that's mapping to see what is in Garda. Yep. Yep. So the task manager, and again I'm I'm using task manager as an example because most of you were thinking it was task manager. <coughs> Task Manager shows you the actual running applications. The question is, it's about startup time. Can you show me the services that I can enable, that I can disable to make my PC start up faster? Task Manager can help you with that because it's only showing you the running applications after the startup. So there's a specific snap-in system configuration that will show you um, these are all the services that are starting up. These are the uh, plugins, like in your taskbar underneath, that are being fired up and so on during the startup. You had a question? Um, MS config is like, well, the system configuration is like the new MS config. But it's a separate tool, it's not part of task manager as such. But now I understand why you also said task manager. But if you play with the different tools, probably it will be a lot easier for you to understand. Resource access is getting access to my disk drives. USB devices, external storage, um, playing with disk pools, partitions, making disks offline available, online, different types of disks and so on, and using branch cache. I was going to ask you, but with, yeah? the, with branch cache, the, the, do the labs and the test questions and so like, is there a system to back it up? Because I don't mind the material with the one I've been using the material for. So the question is, uh, specifically regarding branch cache, if there are, is there any material available on the lab or? Yeah, on the lab. I don't know by heart in the hands-on labs. Uh, I mean, they got like 500 labs or something available. Um, I'm pretty sure there's one lab on branch cache because it's still quite a, a hot topic in, in the Windows client atmosphere. Um, Yeah, the hands-on labs is like the first source. The second source would be the uh, the Windows 8 landing page. So Microsoft.com, WAC, Windows 8, or client, or just go to technet.microsoft.com and then select Windows 8 as a client. And then you got a, a full source, Technet articles, maybe full white papers uh, about how to configure branch cache. I mean, it's not only using uh, a Microsoft official course as your, your training assistant, but even the TechNet library is like the best source you can get. Another one that's not on, on the resource slide is the uh, Virtual Academy. You all know MVA? 
Microsoft Virtual Academy. Who's never heard of it? Good. Uh, you haven't? No? So it's MicrosoftVirtualAcademy.com. Um, it's actually uh, a source with videos, with PDF white papers, documents, um, that helps you in learning about the technology. So it's not like a hands-on experience, but quite a lot of information, for example, comes directly from the technical evangelists or even from the product team uh, directly. Uh, a few weeks ago, I remember, there was one session on uh, Windows 8 deployment where two uh, people from the Microsoft uh, product, the Windows 8 product team, uh, and two Windows 8 MVPs were actually doing a, a four-hour session on every topic you can talk about on Windows deployment. So if you are, for example, in your organization, you're responsible for managing the clients but not for deploying them, you probably don't have any experience with deployment. By going to the virtual academy, following the four-hour training, you probably get already a lot of information, not saying that it should be enough for the exam, but it will already help you. So virtual academy, it's not only about the client, I mean, I think all Microsoft technologies are out on virtual academy. Another cool thing about the virtual academy is if you follow the courses, if you follow the trainings, after every training there's also a list of questions. And you can gain points with that. So if you are working in a larger environment, you can start even some competition with your colleagues. Like, hey, I want to make sure that I'm number one in that specific month, for example. So one of the things that we did, uh, well, I did a few years, two years ago, when I was still working for the partner at the time, um, I, mean, I was running a team of 28 consultants. And when the Virtual Academy came live, we actually started a competition with all the 28 members of the team. And then the first one every month got like a bottle of wine or a bottle of champagne, something like that, to stimulate them to actually train on the technology. So back to uh, branch cache. Quite important, hosted cache and distributed cache and knowing the difference. Hosted cache is, the branch cache is running on a remote site having a server on which you configure branch cache. Distributed means there is no server in that remote site. So again, think about a possible scenario. You are the system admin. You have a few multiple sites. A couple of them have a server available. A couple of them just have a few clients. Like in North America, you have sites with a server. In Europe, you have sites only having clients. What kind of um, branch cache configuration can I allow in Europe? And then you have to make, of course, the right selection. Could be like a possible question. Almost there, I think got like hmm, two minutes, probably running out of time for a few minutes, sorry for that. Windows clients and devices, managing mobile devices, tablets, interaction with group policies, interaction with NFC, secure SIM, remote access, how to manage the mobile access, interaction with, for example, Exchange Active Sync policies. This might be, again, another example of something that you cannot play with in your environment. If you're not running Exchange, you have no hands-on experience with how to configure, how to do, for example, a remote wipe of my device by using Active Sync. So again, you go out to the Internet Virtual Academy or the TechNet Virtual Labs, and you can play with the technology over there design recovery solution. So what happens if my tablet, my mobile device crashes? How can I do the recovery? How can I do an upgrade part of my tablets and so on? Computer reset is the Windows recovery environment, very important part of the Windows 8 exam. And they can be very creative in the way they ask questions like, your client is just gone dead, your hard disk blew up, what's the easiest way to recover the operating system? Some options might work, some options probably won't work anymore because the disk just blew up. Making it a bit quicker, refresh, reset, know where it is, 
on your Windows 8 client where you have to make the settings, where you can do the configuration. What is possible, what is not possible? Again, hands on. Last thing, interaction with cloud services and MDOP. Cloud services mainly focus on Windows Intune. If you've never used Windows Intune, a good thing for your exam is you can create a Windows Intune subscription for free for 30 days. So you go out to the Windows Intune website, it's windowsintune.com. Um, you register by using a Windows Live ID or Microsoft account as they call it nowadays. And you can use the Windows subscription for 30 days. You install the agent, you know how to install it, you know how to remove it, you can find out what's possible, how to manage the Windows firewall, how to manage Windows updates out of the Windows Intune portal. I don't have to tell you that the Windows Intune is quite important as well. Why is that important? Because it's a cloud technology. And if there's one thing I hope you learn from Tagat is that cloud is quite important for Microsoft. So I'm pretty sure you will see some questions on Windows Intune on your exam. MDOP, the desktop optimization pack, it's not that familiar. Who is running MDOP already? Okay. Mm -hmm. it's, um, yeah, it's, it's not a free add-on, but it's, it has the components like UAV, the user environment, uh, AppV for running or streaming virtual applications to your desktops. Uh, that's part of uh, MDOP. There's a specific license. I think it's only valid for uh, enterprise agreements having software assurance. But that's license, and you will never get any questions about licensing on the exam. Maybe on versions like uh, when the difference between Windows 8 Pro, Windows Enterprise, maybe some features are only available on enterprise. But that's not really a licensing question. So MDOP, quite a lot of information. With that, actually, a call to action. So we're almost there. Just book it. Now, does it mean you all run out, you go to the third floor and quickly make the re registration for your exam? If you think like everything the guy was talking about is, OK, common knowledge to me. I know all my topics, I know where to find them, I know how they work, I know how to play with them, then you probably have enough knowledge for taking the exam. If there are certain components where you think after the session like, I don't know what the guy was talking about, never heard of MDOP, never heard of Intune, never heard of Branch Cache, then you're not ready for taking the exam. That's my piece of advice. Second call to action is a bit more fun. We are going down to the parties. Um, is the Tech at Yellow Pants team. I'm actually the founder of it. That's why I've been standing here most of the time behind the black desk. I'm running ugly yellow pants. Um, what's the idea about the yellow pants? Uh, it started last year at Tech at Madrid. Uh, me and a fellow trainer, we actually were wearing yellow pants by coincidence. Uh, it, it wasn't actually planned, but some, someone detected it. Um, and as we are both trainers, both MVPs on Windows 8, we just thought like, you know, we're going to brand it. There's a small website that's up and running now. Uh, every day we organize a small contest, so there's one going on today. But the main thing is, after TagEd, of course, it's a bit less uh, marketing. Um, we will put up information, links to uh, preparation material, if there's some kind of really cool course on MVA that's going live, it will be published on our website as well. And it's not only about client, it's about all Microsoft uh, IT Pro related stuff. Technical stuff, exam related stuff, and so on. So as a summary, where can I find the information specifically for this exam? First of all, the breakout sessions, hands-on labs, Microsoft Solutions Experience location, that's the Ask the Experts. So if you go downstairs to the Expo Hall, to the left, you've got all the different Microsoft product teams available. Go out to the Windows 8 product team, ask them questions, maybe not only specific about the exam, maybe some Windows 8 features in your environment that you're not familiar with, you don't know how to configure them, 
I mean, it's the best source of information. The study hall, again, on the third floor, quite a lot of PCs available taking test exams. And if you want, I'm here, like 10 minutes left for questions if you want. Um, and the last one, where can I find information after TAGET? It's all available online. Everything I talked about, microsoft.com slash learning, you got a, a few buttons where you can select based on technology or based on certification. All the information that I talked about, the white, uh, yeah, the white tables I displayed is actually just copy-paste from that website. So it's all available there. And of course, the Windows 8 um, product website, a lot of information available. Last thing, very important, I'd like you to fill out the evaluation. Very important for me as a speaker. I want to make sure that I gave you the content you were looking for. If not, let me know by filling out the evaluation. Tell me what you liked, tell me what you don't like. Um, it's not only about me, it's also evaluation for Microsoft for the TechEd event. So evaluation is very, very important. And you can win some prizes, so that's like a cool side effect. I think I'm finished, ran like five minutes over time. So that's one beer less that you can drink. No, because it starts at 6.30, I think, right? The happy hour? 6, 6.30, I don't know. From 5 to 6? Yeah. Could be, I don't know. Would be a bit weird because then they are well, taking everyone away from the sessions. Not like those other parties. So if there was a happy hour between 5 and 6, I really have to thank you for being here. <laughs> Choosing for me instead of going to the drinks. So with that, thank you very much. I'm finished. So good evening. The door is closed. That means I can start. Welcome in the session. The 689 upgrade MCSA on Windows 7 to Windows 8, and of course, in meantime, 8.1. Um, I normally start with a question, who has never done an exam prep before? OK, that's good. Because the first, like, first 10 minutes is not really on a technical level. It's more about why is it important for you to actually be certified. But since you're all here for an upgrade part, I assume you're all certified on Windows 7. Who is not? OK, you can stay. I mean, all the content that I'm going to talk about is, of course, mainly targeted towards the ones who are coming from a Windows 7 certification, MCSA, to, uh, why well, it's not MCSA, it's MCITP at that time, um, moving up to the uh, Windows 8. But most of the content is still valid. The only thing is you have to take two separate exams. But I got a few slides on that one as well. But everything else, I mean, the content I'm going to talk about, the things you need for the exam are almost the same. The only thing is that the 689 is like the two other ones in a condensed version. But of course, you need to still need to know the technology. So you can stay. Good. So a couple of things about myself. Um, the main reason why I'm presenting here is I'm an MCT, so Microsoft Certified Trainer. Um, so quite a lot of them here uh, at TechEd this week. So we have the, the study hall on uh, the third floor. Um, we have a, a boot downstairs in the expo. So if you have any questions on the certification part, like um, about development, about Windows uh, Server 2012, things like that, we are actually all staffing as MCTs. So we can help you with that. Besides that, of course, as an MCT, we are not only talking about certification, but we're also talking about the technology. So when I started my career in somewhere in 96, um, I was working more like a, a database admin on SAP, uh, on a mainframe at that time. And then I could follow the first migration from SAP on mainframe to SAP on a Windows platform and T4 server. And I love the infrastructure part, and I stick to the infrastructure part for the rest of my career. So I'm doing a mix between uh, consulting and training, and it depends a bit on the market. So I'm working as a freelance. Sometimes there are periods where I only do like 
three months full-time training week after week. And sometimes it's a mix between two days of coaching, doing a project, some training in the beginning of the project, some training at the end. Um, I'm also an MVP on Windows, Windows expert, uh, which is mainly client-oriented. So now you know who the fellow is here in front of you. Key thing, session objectives, first of all, is not giving you free exam questions. You might think like, yeah, that would be easy. Um, but still quite a lot of people think like, yeah, the exam prep is just an overview of 50 possible questions we can get at the exam. But that's not the idea of the session. The main idea of the session is giving you an overview of all the topics you need to know to actually pass the exam. The main thing is when you walk out of the session in about an hour and you have the feeling like everything the guy was talking about, I know it like this, then walk out, make a reservation and take the exam. During the remainder of TechEd, it's 50% off, so it's 75 US dollar that you have to pay. We also have free test, uh, test exams where you can try. It's not always a guarantee to pass, but if you are quite good in doing the test exams, you normally should pass the real exam as well. So the key thing is walking you through all the content that you need to know. Maybe there are things in Windows 8, Windows 8.1, that you use in your day-to-day -day business, helping customers as a help desk uh, officer or maybe an architect, whatever job role you're in. Um, but maybe that specific topic is not relevant for the exam. So the, the key thing of this session is giving you information what are the topics of all the cool stuff in Windows 8, Windows 8.1? What is the thing that I need to know to make sure that I get through my exam? You'll notice I'm going to talk about Windows 8, 8.1 a lot. Just remember it's a mix between 8 and 8.1. Normally, first of all, it's for you. If you don't agree, let me know. But I think I'm quite sure about what I'm talking about. I took the same path. I mean. When I started working uh, in, in that company at that time, certification was like, yeah, whatever. You don't need to be. But then you move up in, in your career. And then I did in implementations, NT4 server, Windows 2000, uh, Windows XP clients at that time. And at some point in time, you want to show that you actually know the technology. And the only thing you can really show you know the technology is, I'm certified. I have my credentials. And I know, and probably quite a lot of you in the past had maybe colleagues, maybe knew someone like, yeah, the guy did the exam, he passed, but he didn't really know the technology. That has changed a lot. Got a few slides on that one as well. The key thing is about the certification. For you, it's important. But of course, for Microsoft, it's, it's also very important. What's the thing about having a certification program if it's worth nothing? If you go out like, hey, you know, I'm the MCSA, I'm an MCSE on server platform messaging, whatever technology you want to get certified on, and some hiring manager says like, yeah, I know, but the Microsoft certification doesn't mean anything. Anybody can do it. If you're like 12 years old or you're like 60 years old, knowing the te technology or not knowing the technology, anybody could pass the exam, then you are losing the value of the certification. So Microsoft two years ago, did a lot of changes in the MCP program, so the Microsoft Certified Professional Program, and they made the exams harder. Now, that's an easy explanation. Why is it considered harder? Because it's more relevant to the practical experience, the hands-on experience with the technology. So my key message in this session, and I'll probably repeat it quite a lot, is you need to have hands-on experience with the technology. And that's for a quite a lot of people a change compared to a few years ago. Where you could just read a book, search some stuff on the internet, and take the exam. And cool, I passed the exam. It doesn't work like that anymore. I mean, we've been talking with a few, uh, well, quite a lot of people here who are actually taking the exam. Like, yeah, you know, it's 50% off. Uh, I just try it out. If I fail, I'm actually not really losing my money. I can do a retake the day after. And then they walk in, like, yeah, I'm going to do it, and we'll see. And then they come back, like, yeah, I failed. But actually, it's good I failed, because I don't know the technology. So it's like, Microsoft, you actually did a good thing there. So that's quite important. Next thing, 
certification is important for your career. I started as a database admin. Maybe they did a mistake there, I don't know. Uh, but I fell in love with the infrastructure part. And by taking exams, by being certified, for me personally, it was a lot easier to move up in my career. I moved from DBA, of course, but then Helpdesk, uh, a technical guy installing the PCs, installing servers in the ice cold server rooms. Um, now all the way up to being freelance, being an infrastructure architect, mainly because I'm certified in the technologies. And people are actually understanding, like, if you got this list of certifications, if you are doing these trainings as a trainer, if you are doing these uh, consulting projects, you got the hands-on experience. And that's what I mean by its importance for your career. You can move up in the chain, if you want to call it like that. So that's quite important. Now, a couple of things about the changes in the Microsoft uh, certification program where you can consider the exams being harder. First of all, they are more relevant to the nowadays technologies, to the nowadays environments. One of the topics, and I'm going to talk about the technical ones in, in the next few minutes, but one of the things is quite a lot about mobile device management, interaction with cloud. Why? Because the operating system, your Windows 8 machine you install in the office, it's not that isolated machine anymore. There are certain, um, yeah, like cloud components, the Windows Store, for example, uh, the OneDrive, it's, it's built in in the operating system. And you as an, uh, a Windows 8 admin, Windows 8 uh, system installer, you actually have to know all these components. So you might think, yeah, but even in my environment, you are actually blocking users. The exam is already quite updated to 8.1. But there still might be some scenarios where it's explicitly mentioned, like you are working in a Windows 8 environment. And maybe on that specific topic, something has changed in 8.1, and it's not valid for that question. So when I'm talking about 8 or 8.1, just think that it's the Windows 8 operating system with the 8.1 update installed. Good. Any other questions before I continue? You're all good with the objective? The audience, again, not that important. Well, it's important, but the key thing is, first of all, it's an upgrade exam, which means you normally, <coughs> sorry, you normally have to have the certification for Windows 7 already. But if not, I already mentioned it, all the content will be almost the same. Just keep in mind that this content is like condensed format, and if you don't have the uh, Windows 7 credential yet, you have to take two exams. But of course, it's the same technology, so there's no real change. So a couple of words about the certification. First of all, why do you take an exam? Why do you take an exam? It's mainly for you. And OK, you might think, yeah, that's, that's just easy talk. I mean, my boss is forcing me to take my exam. He is paying for the exam, so if I fail, he's even more angry than he already might be, I don't know. Um, but the key thing is, even if your company is asking for it, if you're working for a Microsoft partner, they might use your credentials for staying a Microsoft certified partner. Um, if you're working in any other organization where um, the value of the certification is important out of the company, they come to your office like, hey, can you take the exam, please? Because yeah, we think you're our Windows 8 guy to be. Uh, and then you think like, yeah, OK, I'll, I'll take the course, I'll take the exam, um, just because my boss ordered me to do. But that's not the main idea. The key thing is becoming certified, being certified, first of all, is for yourself. It helps you in your career. It shows you like the expert of the technology. So it's 